Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many love the Lord? Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that as we break the bread of life, that revelation will come to the hearts and minds of people, that, that the yokes will be destroyed, burdens will be removed, they'll be able to walk in the light as you're in the light. Glory to God. And Father, I thank you that we trust the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of the living God, to give us unction in the Spirit, praise God. We thank you for utterance in the Holy Ghost. We thank you for signs and wonders that confirm the word. Hallelujah following the, this, this message this morning. We thank you that every need shall be supplied and met according to, your, according to your word and according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We decree it as so and believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll go ahead over and run over to the book of 1 Peter, or flip over to the book of 1 Peter. Hallelujah. And we'll be in the first chapter. <coughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. We put the, we, we, somebody asked me, you want to just go ahead and put the podium down since you're always putting it down? And I think so. Amen. Just say it was a step, and I'm moving this before I spill water on it. We'll short circuit the little light thingy. What's the light thingy? Well, it's the control that turns that light on. It's supposed to be right at the top of the podium that's out here. Huh? Lost, lost some word. Hallelujah. You know, if you were in... Um, if you were in Russia or somewhere, or, or in some of these communist countries years ago, uh, you would have gotten a page of a Bible. They would have passed it around. You would have memorized your page and then given it to somebody else. Hallelujah. And then everybody would just keep sharing the Bible that way. Aren't you glad you can have your seven or eight Bibles at home? Amen. All right. First Peter chapter 1. We're going to be ministering this morning on the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Amen. I, now, look, I know a lot of our churches have, have taken uh, the songs about the blood out of their hymnals. They call it, you know, a, 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 a bloody religion, not a bloody, but, but, but a, um, a uh, heathenistic reference to talk about the blood of Jesus. And I think, that's eh, just like the devil, to go after the very thing that is the crux of everything that we believe. Yeah. Amen. You know, so uh, let's, let's just jump in here. We're going to talk about the precious, precious, hallelujah, blood of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, if you read the King James Bible, the word conversation does not mean talking. It is an old Elizabethan term that means manner of life. Okay, so the Greek word that was translated conversation in 1611 or, you know, 400 years ago uh, would mean something along the lines of manner of life. Today, it means two people sitting around uh, flapjawing with each other. All right, just talking back and forth. Back and forth. Well, that, he's not talking about having your, your own manner of conversation, you know, talking about this. He's talking about your manner of life. Everybody say manner of life or how you conduct yourself, how you live. Okay. Um, so, because, but as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of how you conduct yourself. God wants you to be holy in how you conduct yourself. Everybody say glory. glory. Now, I know there's people that are running around saying, you know, you're under grace and it doesn't matter what you do because, you know, it's already forgiven and already washed. Then why did <clears throat> uh, Peter write to the church and say, be holy in how you conduct yourself? I always ask these questions because when somebody says a dumb statement, I like to ask a question, you know, that kind of, you know, if, if what you're saying is true, that all I have to do is sit down, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm under grace, then why would God have his people, have his apostles take the time to tell you to live holy if it didn't matter? It's because it does matter. Everybody say it does matter. Okay. All right. Because, he said, now listen, he says this here. As he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. God said he wants you to live like him. God wants you to do things like him. Well, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Why God would not tell you to do something you could not do. Now, that's where the grace of God comes in to empower you to live the way he said that. That's empowering grace. Amen? In other words, there is a grace, if you'll, if you'll act on it and receive it, where God will empower you to live as a decision of your heart, to, to live in a way that honors and pleases him. Can you say amen? And say thank God. It's not by your strength. It's by, it's by him working in you. And, if you. and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges every, um, according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, 
with, with an awe of not doing what you're supposed to do. Now, I heard somebody the other day was saying, you know, that God, no, God don't judge anybody. Oh, really? He just says here, who without respect to persons, judges according to every man's work. So what, you know, people say, what I do doesn't matter. And everybody say, oh, yes, it does. If God's going to judge you according to your work, then what you do, what? Matters. I mean, it's like, can you not read? I mean, now, listen, these are people who, say, who claim to know what the Bible says. I'm not talking about somebody who doesn't have a Bible. And these are people who think they know what the Bible says. Go around telling everybody they, they're an expert in what the Bible says. They just don't quote the Bible when they tell them things that the Bible tells you to do. Or they're, they're going against that. So, moving right along. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or vain lifestyles or manner of life. You received by tradition from your fathers. In other words, we're not redeemed. Listen, you did not get redeemed by money. When Jesus came, he didn't bring enough, he didn't bring enough, you know, carts of gold. How many, how many saw um, um, oh, uh, the Cal Monte Cristo, you know? And uh, he shows up to buy the guy's house and the guy, you know, and the, and the guy said, get off my property. He goes back to back, open the back of the wagon and all this gold and diamonds and jewels. And the next thing you know, they're exchanging papers. Well, see, in the world, you can have enough gold or whatever to buy your way in. You can buy influence. You can buy, you can buy this. You can buy that. But I'm telling you, when it came to your relationship with God the Father, there was not enough money on the earth, on the, in the universe. There wasn't enough money in heaven to purchase your redemption. There was something greater that had to be done. There was something that was more valuable that had to be given in order to buy you back. Why? Because it wasn't a monetary thing. It wasn't a corruptible thing that God was trying to redeem. He was trying to redeem humanity, and it was going to take something greater than what humanity's value was to buy him. And it took his only son. It took the blood. It goes on and says here, you weren't redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain lifestyles received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It took something greater than silver and gold. I want you to know, and that's why the devil fights it so hard. Yeah. He don't care if the church is running around getting you know, money and milking money and raping people out of money. I mean, you know, figuratively speaking, raping the church out of their money. He doesn't care if you got all the money. He doesn't care if, if some, somebody gets all the money and hoards it up somewhere. He doesn't care. But he don't want you talking about the blood. I mean, you got people who, won't even, who don't even know, don't even believe in the blood. Don't believe in the devil, for that matter of fact. You got people in the mainline stream churches. I don't believe there's a real devil. Poor Jesus did not know he was having a conversation with someone that did not exist. Hello. Amen. The Bible, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Poor Jesus just didn't know that wasn't real. I mean, they, you know, I, I have to agree with Dad Hagen. He used to say, you know, he heard all these people had all these initials behind their name, and he finally figured that Ph.D. meant post hole digger. Because a common post hole digger would have more sense than some of the stuff these guys purport and spill out. There's no such thing as a real devil. He's just figurative. Wow! Let a third, a figurative individual led a third of the angels in rebellion against God in heaven. Hello? Jesus saw him kicked out of heaven. He came in the Garden of Eden and tempted Adam and Eve. Had a conversation with him. Didn't exist. Folks, the devil's real. Satan is real. He was Lucifer, <clears throat> the bright and morning star. He was the cherub, he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God until iniquity was found in him. And then he was cast as, uh, from, from the presence of God as profane. He wasn't a force. He wasn't an image. He wasn't an allegory. He's a real person. He's a fallen angel. The Bible said he came down having great wrath. Not a figure, not a, not a concept. The devil came down into the earth having great wrath. He hates the blood of Jesus. I said he hates the blood of Jesus. He doesn't want the church talking about it. I mean, you know, I grew up classical Pentecostal. We used to plead the blood all the time. I plead the blood. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of them didn't even know what they were talking about. They just said, I plead the blood. Well, what they really, they're pleading their case before the throne of God based on the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank God for the blood. Are you, are you here? Yeah. The word of God calls the blood of Jesus precious. 
Hallelujah. Webster says precious means to be highly valuable and costly, to be highly esteemed, to be cherished and beloved. And we got churches taking songs with the blood of Jesus out of our hymnals. I mean, how many of you remember singing, there's power, power, you know, P-O-W, apostrophe R? There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. People don't want to sing about the blood. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You better get a revelation of how powerful the blood of Jesus is because your redemption is, was purchased by it. Your redemption is sustained by it. Your, your ongoing forgiveness and cleansing is taking place because of the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you right now, in the mercy seat of God between you and the Father is the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And we'll get to that later. But you know, in the Old Testament, they would have, the high priest would have to go in once a year with the blood of bulls and, and goats and calves and go into the Holy of Holies and put it on the mercy seat. You see, the Bible teaches us that, the, that what we see in Leviticus and, and on all the Old Testament law of the tabernacle was a type of what Moses saw in the heavenly. There is a real mercy seat. And it's before God the Father today, right now. And on that mercy seat is not the blood of a bull or goat or a calf. It's the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so the Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Glory to God. In the time of need to receive help and mercy. Glory to God. Why? Because the blood of Jesus cries out forgiven. Yeah. That's why the devil hates the blood. Now the devil breaks his authority and breaks his power. The blood of Jesus breaks the devil's authority and power. Yeah. Yeah. He hates the blood. Yeah. The devil is singing about the blood. Brother Summerall used to sing, you'd hear him I mean, a lot of times. He'd be in a service. He'd just stop and start singing, Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. See, the old, I'm going to tell you, these old Pentecostal guys knew something about the power of the blood. They, knew, they saw miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm going to tell you, that you don't, don't get up tight, don't, don't run out. They saw the dead raised. They saw the maimed whole. They saw people healed from all kinds of stuff because they believed in the power of the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. Yeah. Amen. And that devil's running around trying to get the church. Well, we don't want to talk about the blood. You know, that makes us kind of heathenistic. You know, it makes man, you know, this blood covenant stuff. Let's just talk about rock climbing walls. We'll get people to come to our churches. Yeah, and, they're gonna get, and they'll be bleeding, but it won't be the blood of Jesus. They'll fall off and scrape, scrape something up. No, the blood of Jesus is to be highly valuable and costly, highly esteemed, cherished and beloved by the church. Glory to God. So if you find a hymnal, they can't take all the blood songs out and get rid of your hymnal. Hello? There's no works you can do to get into heaven. Amen. You can't earn it. It's done because of what Jesus did. We receive it by faith. Glory to through by grace, through faith, not by yourselves. It's the gift of God. But I'm telling you something. It was all done because of the blood. I said it was all done because of the blood. Now let's look at substitution. The importance of blood is based on something that, was, that, that theologically is referred to as substitution. <clears throat> and I'm going to put it in real simple terms for you this morning. Jesus became what we were so we could become what he is. The righteousness of God in Christ. I don't believe that. Just calm, just, just hold on to your, 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 your briefs or your boxes, whichever one you got on. I started to say drawers, but you know, anyway, that'll, that'll really tell what, what part of the country you're from. Eastern Carolina, you know, we don't wear, we don't wear underwear, they wear drawers. Hallelujah. Now that's what you put them in. Now, not down there. You, could, you start talking about briefs and boxers down there, they say, huh? All right. If you get a huh when you say that, just say drawers, they'll know what you're talking about. All right. Can you believe I said that in church? Yeah, I'll say something else too that mess you up. The, the term substitution, meaning an exchange so that something could be, some, a penalty or something could be, uh, something could be uh, enforced on one in the place of another. Now, how many ever have read the story or saw the movie, uh, The Tale of Two Cities? How many, raise your hand. Well, you, need, you need to see it. The guy was in love with a girl, you know, and, 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 but the guy she was in love with was, you know, 
destined to be sentenced to death for something he had done or whatever. And at the last minute, he, he, he goes into the thing as they're about to ride off and hang him. He, he somehow switches places with him. And so, because of his love for that girl, he died so she could have what she wanted. Now, you would call that sick, but, you know, <clears throat> I, 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 you know if I was counseling him, I'd say find another woman. You know, just... <laughs> but, you know, you, but, but the parallels, you know, a, lot of, a lot of old literature was written paralleling Bible or biblical themes. Okay? Now, uh, Le Miserable was, was very, very much a redemption movie. I mean, or, or play, or, you know, the book. The book's, what, 3,000 pages long or something? You know? It's, it's, but it's about redemption. It is a biblical themes of redemption. And the Tale of Two Cities is the biblical themes of substitution. Because of the love. Now, listen. The son loved the father so much, he was willing to become what we are, were and suffer the penalty we were due in order to present us to the father as what he is. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Glory to God. Now, we know that because he had no sin in him, he never committed sin. Jesus never committed sin. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was, is, and is to come. Okay? You got people now, there's a new thing out, you know, Western theologians. They got it all messed up. There's no such thing as hell. Jesus really isn't the Son of God. I tell you, the devil's working overtime. Why? Because he knows his time is short on the earth. And squirrely doctors are running around. And they're coming from people who call themselves Christians. Just because you name the name of Christ don't mean you're Christ. Hello? You got to kind of... I mean, one major religious leader just came out two weeks ago and said, you don't have to believe in God to be, go to heaven. Really? I think Hebrews is in the Catholic Bible. Don't you? Is it not? Okay. It's, it's, it's in there. And it says they that come to God must believe that he is. Well, that kind of that does away with not believing God and still going to heaven. Now, you've got to believe in God. Amen. So there's, a lot, there's all kinds of stuff. And they're hitting everywhere. They're hitting everybody they can hit. They're hitting non-Catholic churches, Catholic churches, you know, liturgical churches, non-liturgical churches, non-liturgical churches, word churches, non-word churches. We mean non-word churches. They don't ever preach anything but what they think. That's a non-word church. You've got to have the Bible. Amen? So all this stuff's going on, and all, the, all, this, uh, all this resistance is going on. But people don't understand substitution. Why, why did Jesus have to take our place? The Bible says if we could have found the man, but there's none to be found. The only one who could take man's place. Why? Because man was created a little lower than God. Now, if you'll read the book of uh, the Psalms, I believe, is it the eighth psalm? It says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, for thou hast created him a little lower than the angels. Now, King James translators just didn't have the guts to translate it what it said. Just be right up flat honest with you. It was Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God and the, in the, listen, in the plurality of three or more. Deity in the plurality of three or more. All right, it was a Hebrew word. Meaning deity, well, we know who the three are, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And it said in the Hebrew, thou hast created him, man, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast created him a little lower than Elohim, than yourself. The only, since man was created just below God, then it took God to redeem him. There was no man, because all men were under Adam, all men fell, all men were in sin. You had to have a sinless sacrifice. Hallelujah. Let's read Hebrews 9, 19 through 26. We're talking about substitution. Jesus had to take our place and receive our penalty so we could go to heaven. Man, you ought to appreciate your redemption. You ought to be thanking God, hallelujah, you're not going to hell. There was a price paid so your hell was not your destiny. Because when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, Satan became his spiritual father. Genesis says, in the day that thou eatest there, thou shalt surely die. That's not, what it, that's not what it says in Hebrew. King James that says, says it that way. But it, see, you've got to understand, there are, King James is a word-for-word translation. Most translations are word-for-word. They don't put, uh, except in the women's Bible, uh, also known as the Amplified. That was a joke, guys. Come on. <clears throat> you know, the, if you read the Amplified, it's got all the extra words in it. And so they, so they, they start calling it the woman's Bible. 
Because they have, they, they have men, men are like straight line headliners. Women want all the details. Hallelujah. Gina's just looking at me. Did you not get your caffeine this morning? Yeah. <laughs> it's wordy. It's, but it, the wordiness is very good. But in, the, but in most word-for-word translations, it says, In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. But see, the Hebrew says, In the day you eat thereof, in dying, you will die. What does it mean? Man's triune being. He's spirit, soul, and body. He died spiritually in the Garden of Eden. It took 900 years for his body to die. How do you know he died spiritually? The light went out and they knew they were naked. The glory left them. See, they, they weren't naked. I'm going to people, we're going to have, we're going to like, we're like Adam and Eve in the Garden. No, you ain't. They didn't have any clothes. They were clothed. They were clothed in the glory of God. And here's the example that you have from the Bible. When Moses came out of the mount, his face shone so bright, they had to put a veil over it so they could look at him. Then I was just, listen, that's a man who hadn't been born again, just got into the presence of God, and his countenance shone so bright from just being in the presence of God, they had to cover it so they could look at him. Now, then we have the other, the other example is Jesus and what is referred to as the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, Peter, James, and John run up there with him, fall asleep. They wake up, and there's Jesus glowing. Master, let's build three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, you know, and just hang out here. What happened? The Bible says his rain, it became white. Apparently, it wasn't white before. What? The glory of God got released out of him. Now, this is just a hint of what Adam and Eve, look, see, <clears throat> what Adam and Eve looked like in the garden. Because of the lack of sin, or not, not having entered into sin, not having the, the experience of sin in them, they were created perfect and whole. They, so the glory of God clothed them. And when, they commit, when Adam committed high treason and partook of the... Listen, the Bible, is, the devil will trick you. Eve got all messed up and said, we're not supposed to eat, and no, I'm supposed to touch it. Well, you know, the Bible said they were supposed to dress the garden. I mean, they had to touch it. Hello? They just weren't supposed to eat of it. See, the devil got her all confused. Adam should have stepped in there and done what he's supposed to do, but he didn't. But <laughs> Shannon's not in here. We have Sandy taking her place. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, Sandy, for the amen. Adam should have, that's right. He should the, the Bible says the woman was not in the transgression. The man stood there, and the Bible says she gave the man with her, and when they ate of the fruit, they knew they were naked. Why? The glory went out. Why? Because they rebelled against the word of God, and when they did rebel against what God's word said, they died spiritually. Now, I know we have to keep covering ground sometimes, but the word die or death in the Bible in reference to humanity does not mean cessation of existence. <clears throat> it means separation. Spiritual death is the separation of the human spirit from God, who is life. Ever say God is life. If you are separated from God, you are spiritually dead. Doesn't mean you cease to exist. It means you're now existing out that, outside the sphere of God's life, <coughs> the manner that God possesses life. Amen. Physical death is the separation of the human spirit from the physical body. Now, the body without the spirit is dead. In other words, it can't function. Okay? But for you to die, in other words, to die, what we refer to as physically, does not mean you cease to exist. It means you've been separated from your earth suit. Amen. Your body's your earth suit. And just put NASA on your arm when you get home. I'm just messing. Just don't go get a tattoo and that's on your arm. All right? S eternal death or the second death will be the eternal separation of fallen spirits who rebelled against God, not in purgatory, in this life, and did not accept Jesus Christ as Lord. They will be eternally separated. Remember, death and hell will give up their dead, and they'll be judged, and then they will be cast out, and, and, you know, and that'll be the second death. In other words, they will be eternally separated from God's presence. Now, this morning we're saying, you know, um, we're just talking about the presence of God. How, how wonderful the presence of God is. And for people to die without Jesus, you will spend eternity tormented by, by a, a, a 
renegade spirit who hates God and hates his creation, and he will torment those who rebelled against God, and his whole plan is to make sure he has as many as he can in hell so he can just torment them through, through eternity because he hates God. Hello. So death doesn't mean to cease to exist. So when Adam died, he died spiritually. In other words, he was separated from God. Satan became his spiritual father. I don't believe that. Go read John 8, 44. You're, uh, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of him you will fulfill. Isn't that what Jesus said? <laughs> Woo! Everybody pull a Ric Flair and go, Woo! That's not real good. You, know? you are your father the devil, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh he lie, he, a lie, he speaketh not of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is the father of all lies. Satan is the spiritual father of all fallen human spirits. When man is born into the earth, he's born at, at that time until the point in time where he becomes conscious of of sin, and he, the Bible says, Paul says that the law revived and I died. At that point, we, we a, time, a lot of times refer to as the, the uh, age of accountability or so forth. You know, when is that? As soon as you know. Hello? Let me tell you, it ain't no, there ain't no year. When you're 12 years old, you can sin until you're 12, and that's okay. When you know. Hello? I remember you thinking, boy, you know, we kind of used to teach people 12 years old. You know, there's no Bible for that. We just used to say that. Everybody said, boy, I can, I can get away with all kinds of stuff until I'm 12. Then, I gotta get right to, then God can deal with me. Hey, don't worry that way. If, you, if you're planning like that, you're in trouble. Are y'all here or you going home? So man, so man becomes part of Satan's kingdom, and then Jesus said, you must be born again. To get out of Satan's kingdom, you must be born again. Now remember, under the old covenant, they couldn't get born again. They could only get covered one year from one year to one year. And if you're living right, when, it came, when you die, you had everything kind of covered. You got to go to Abraham's bosom and hang out what? Until Jesus, the Bible says Jesus went to those who were held in captivity and preached to them. Hallelujah. And you know what? They had to get born again. Now, you, you know, can you imagine the party that was going on in Abraham's bosom when they saw Jesus coming up? Hallelujah. David started to dance. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. All right. The Hebrews 9, I haven't even got there. And we're going we're, to we're have to move our services back to 10 o'clock. My goodness. For when Moses had spoken, for Hebrews 9, 19, when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. In other words, he made a testament or covenant. We're old, only this word testament refers to and means also covenant. So this is the blood of the covenant which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled both the, <coughs> the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things by the law are purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Now, even under the old covenant, blood had to be shed for remission of sin. Okay? It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Now, that is the blood of bulls and of goats. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. He didn't go into the earthly tabernacle. I'm going to tell you something. The day he died on the cross, the veil of the temple was written twain from top to bottom. This signified that the Holy Ghost no longer dwell in tabernacle and a tent made by the hands of men. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just like when Jesus was on the earth, the Bible says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as thou, the only begotten of the Father. The word dwelt in the Greek actually means tented or tabernacled. His fleshly body tabernacled the glorious God, Emmanuel, God with us, as he walked the earth, glory to God. And when he died on that cross, that veil was rent and said, no more. Why? Because God never intended to live in a tent. God intended to live in man, praise God. Hallelujah. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest. Glory to God, entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once... 
In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now that was for past, present, and future sin. Jesus carried it all. The Bible said if, 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 it was, if it had to be done like in the Old Testament, he would have had to suffer every year from the foundation of the world and go back to the cross every year and go back to the cross every year just like those nutcases over in the Philippines who keep crucifying themselves. You can't crucify yourself and get anywhere except dead. And heaven may be a little quicker if you really believe on the Lord. You, you can't go to the cross. Jesus went for us. You can't shed your blood. He shed his for us. Somebody say amen. Is this a little hot out there? Not too, okay. I'm just talking about volume wise. The mic. Is, is it too hot? We all good? Just a little bit. Just a, tat, a teeny weeny, itty bitty. Uh, anyway. Help me, Lord. Hallelujah. Now. <laughs> <clears throat> why could his blood redeem us? Why is it that his blood had the power to wash us clean? Leviticus 17, 7, 11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make it, listen, in the Old Testament, an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now, under the Old Covenant, they were atoned for. They were covered year by year by year by year by year. In other words, say, uh, I'm not sure when, when um, Passover is, I don't know the dates, but say on Passover of this year, you went, to the, you went to Jerusalem, you carried your lamb in there, the priest offered it up, you got covered up, woo, praise God, another year. Come next year at Passover, guess what? You got to do it all over again. Because you weren't washed, you were, you were on a promissory note. It was an atonement, it was a covering, it was not a washing away. You didn't get cleansed under the old covenant, you got covered. In other words, sin was hidden until Jesus came, not to uncover it so that we... You know, he did uncover it, but he uncovered it so he could take it and take the handwriting of ordinance, Colossians. The handwriting of ordinance that was against us and took it and nailed it to his cross. Oh, glory to God, hallelujah. All that stuff that had been covered up, all that stuff that was just sitting there every year, I mean, they had uncovered it, get washed again, put all the new ones in there and cover them back up. Jesus came and uncovered it, picked it all up, and took it to his cross, glory to God, and nailed every handwriting of ordinance that was against you that was contrary to us and nailed it to his cross, glory to God. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. glory. <laughs> That'll make a Pentecost out of you. I don't care if you're frozen chosen. That'll make, that's enough to make you get up and run. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> now, we know that blood was shed for Adam and Eve because God, the Bible says, and Adam also said unto his wife, did the Lord make coats of skins and clothing? What? He had to kill animals to get skins to cover their nakedness. That only covered the nakedness of their body. Their sin, had the blood had to be shed. And from that point on, were animal sacrifices where innocent blood was continually shed to cover the sin of mankind. No wonder lions don't like us. I mean, a lot of critters don't like us. They want to eat us. What's what, what the reason that they, they don't lay down with the lamb and just eat veggies? It's man's fault the lion didn't eat the lamb before. Everything got thrown in the kilter. Now, under Moses' law, there were, th there, were, there were five different types of offerings. Three of them were called voluntary burnt and peace and meal all praise and worship offers you didn't have to do it you could do it if you wanted to it was just an honor to come honor the lord but then there were two involuntary offerings the two the two involuntary, <laughs> two involuntary offerings are the sin offering and the trespass offering the sin offering was for the nature of sin for what you did you just said people just sinned sinned against god did stuff they shouldn't do just sin that was the sin offering. You had to, you had to bring it out. Every, every year you had to bring an offering for the sin offering. <clears throat> in between Passover, because remember, the temple was running all the time. In between Passovers, where the sin offering was offered, you had to come and bring trespass offerings. Now, trespass offerings are just like they say, when you've done something against someone else, when you've offended them. And in that offering, you still had to carry a blood sacrifice to cover your sin, but then you had to pay restitution. Woo! Plus a 20% fine. Well, I'll tell you what, if we made people re bring restitution every time they did something wrong, hello, 
They stole you $20,000 car. They got, to, they got to go out now and get you another, another car and get it back to you. They got to give you tw another $4,000 on top of it. Hello? You know, so trespass offerings were the ones where you trespass against people. Sin was for, for the trespasses against God or your nature. That was done once a year. That had to be done once a year. The trespass could be done all during the year. You know, so if I smack cap, I'd have to go offer, you know, a trespass offering and get forgiveness and restoration. If I broke his jaw or something, I'd have to pay for that plus 20%. I didn't smack you. It was figurative. It was figurative. I keep striking him out, you know. If he says something I don't like, I just I strike one. If it's really bad, I go ahead and ring him up. Yeah, we're around the bottom of the ninth with two outs. I'm just messing. So, number one, so we, we have the substitution. Jesus took your place. Thank God Jesus took your place. Somebody say, I'm glad Jesus took my place. How many are born again here? How many, how many are born of the Spirit of God? How many, how many have been born again, saved? All right. Now, see, now if, I was, if you're in Pentecostal church, we want to know how many are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to thank the Lord. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me the whole truth to the end. Glory to God. I remember when I first got saved, I was, all in the, I was, I was so into the Word. And I, was all, and so I, I went in, first testimony to me. Woo, praise God. I want to thank the Lord that I'm born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going through to the end full of faith and power. Who wants to go with me? And yeah, they all kind of looked at you. You messed up the testimony meeting. They've been saying saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost for 35 years. Young people can be arrogant. I was young and dumb. Thank God I grew up. Amen. You just kind of go with the flow. Don't have to upset anybody's apple cart. Isn't that right? But we need, Jesus took our place on the cross. He shed his blood. And when his blood was shed, and let me say something. Have, did you remember when Jesus said this, uh, when he was raised from the dead, he said something very interesting. He said, touch me, handle me, for a spirit hath not what? Flesh and bone. Didn't say anything about his blood. Why? Because he don't have any blood in him. His blood's on the mercy seat. What's going through his veins? The glory of God. His blood's on the mercy seat. He said, hand me, a spirit has not flesh and bone. Glory to God. His blood's, his blood's on the mercy seat. And his blood's talking. You know, the Bible even said that Abel's blood cries out, cried out from the earth. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Let me tell you something. Every baby that's been aborted, their blood cries out for justice. That went over big. It better go over real big in this church. We're not some liberal, whacked out, crazy church that thinks, well, everybody, we, we just got to let people have, do what they want to do. They're, the blood of those babies cries out. Now, I'm going to tell you something. In this life or the next, whoever did all that, will be judged because their blood cries out for justice. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Oh, you went and got political. No. It's a scourge on our society at this time of life. And, and you know, Jesus would have said something about abortion. Paul would have said a whole lot more. Yeah. Paul probably would have turned them over to the devil for the destruction of their flesh. And if they're not saved, maybe they get saved. If not, they just go ahead and go to hell. I mean, he would have been rough. We think, we think everybody's hunk of door is sloppy goppy. But anyway, let's get back to Jesus taking our place. The life of the flesh is in the blood. His blood was shed so we could go to heaven. So we could be purchased back. We weren't purchased with silver and gold. Now, back, back to that. Remember 1 Peter? But with the precious blood of Christ. Glory to God. All right. Hallelujah. Thank God we've been purchased by the precious blood of Christ. Amen. And it's now time to keep going. Who will give me five more minutes? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. All right, thank you. That's all I needed was 30 more minutes. So, hallelujah. Let's, talk, let's get in here. The precious blood of Jesus. I'm going to cover one point and finish up next week or tonight. You gotta come, come back tonight. We are justified or declared righteous by his blood. Now, the word justification is a legal term. <clears throat> You've been redeemed, 
But in being redeemed, you were declared righteous or justified. You are when, when, you, when you came into the kingdom of God, you were declared legally in the realm of the Spirit, you were declared to be in right relationship with God. Now, you just don't lose that overnight. You don't lose that because you, you, you flip somebody off because they cut in front of you in your car. There's something going on that I need to know about, Greg. Who you been flipping off, all right? <laughs> Put the camera on him so he can repent to all those people. <laughs> I'm just messing. I'm messing. I'm messing. We had two people in church at one time, and one, one of the guys riding down the road, and the guy, one, one of the guys cut him off messing with him, and he didn't realize who it was, and the guy flipped him off. So the flipper got a phone call. Hey, brother, appreciate you flipping me off back there. <laughs> Better watch who you flip off as a believer. You might be flipping off a brother in the church. <laughs> now, just because you mess, and Greg didn't, he's not flipping people off. He, he was just, <laughs> it's not his nature. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to watch his car from now on. Let's see what he's doing. All right. <laughs> it is a legal term. See, when you were born again, you were declared righteous, justified. Then we have how many little things people do with justify just as if I'd never sinned. But right, justification and right and, and being declared righteous are really the same, are, are really uh, synonyms of terminology. When you came into the kingdom, you were declared to be. Now, righteous, righteousness, a lot of people don't even know what the word really means. How many of you ever heard of the Bill of Rights? It used to be called the Bill of Righteousness. See? People don't have rights. They, are, they, they, they have to be in right relation with the government to have these things. Now, if you're a felon, you don't have the right to bear arms. If you're a felon, you don't have the right. To, well, you, you had the right to go to jail. You don't have rights. But see, people shorten it down to rights. Everybody goes, I got rights. I got No, no, no. They are the bill of righteousness. They are the, it's the bill of people who are in right relationship with the, co the government, the country. And, you and all these things apply to you when you're in right relationship. If you become a, um, a terrorist, you're no longer in right relation, they don't apply, they don't apply to you anymore. Understand? When you got declared righteous by God, you came into right relationship with him. You were declared to be in right relationship with God by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 5, 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. Thank God we've been declared righteous, and therefore we're in right relationship with him. We are saved or delivered from the wrath to come. Can I ever say hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. How many want to go through the wrath? Didn't think so. If you do, we'll pray for your mental faculties. Amen. All right? Nobody wants to go through the wrath. I remember growing up, you know, I remember growing up in church, boy, and they start talking, they show those films on, the, on, um, on uh, Armageddon. And they show films on the, you know, the great tribulation. And they show films on people suffering. And boy, I mean, you couldn't even sleep that night. You know, you had the 666 in your forehead. And you would pray for the mountains to fall on you. You couldn't get away from it. And you, you still end up going to hell no matter what. I mean, nobody, nobody I saw lined up to go to hell. The only ones I ever knew were doing acid and listening to Led Zeppelin. Stairway to heaven. All right? Or... Listen to the Eagles about Hotel California or whatever. Still messed up. 666, Alexander Crowley on the balcony of the inside of the album jacket with the 666 on his forehead. Saw it. Didn't know that, did you? Yep, right up there. The, the satanic evangelist calling this what he calls himself. Hotel California is about going to hell. You can check in, but you can't ever check out. <coughs> Whole song is about hell. It's coming off your MP3 this afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah stairway to heaven was satanists believe there was a back stairway out of hell into heaven and after a certain amount of time they could they could slip up into heaven no there's no back stairway out of hell you don't get out you were declared righteous by his blood you've been saved from the wrath to come because you accepted jesus you've been born again and there was a declaration made because of his blood on a legal basis. See, redemption or being redeemed is not the declaration. Redemption is what was done in order to procure 
the declaration. Does that make sense? In other words, redemption is the price that was paid to get you declared righteous or right st- in right standing with God. A lot of people got this idea of righteous meaning perfect or whatever. You know, they'll, quote, they'll quote Romans. There's none righteous, no, not one. Go read that in context. It's talking about unregenerated man outside of Jesus Christ. It is not talking about that nobody's righteous on the planet today. Outside of God, their mouth is full of poison. You know, well, it goes on and on and on. There's none that do with good. You know, you listen to all that stuff in Romans, over there in Romans, I think the third chapter, and all the stuff that's said there, it's all referring to unregenerated man. But see, I got born again. Hallelujah. Jesus came into my life. Hallelujah. I've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And by the mouth of God Almighty, I have been decreed to be in right relationship with him. And so have you, glory to God. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Why do you think the devil doesn't want us talking about the blood? Because much more now, being declared to be in right relationship with God by His blood. Let's don't talk about the blood. Hello? Let's talk about, you know, doing good works. Let's go talk about, you know, doing, dancing with Mr. Bojangles or something. Let's talk about, you know, helping little old ladies across the street. Let's talk about doing good community service things. Let's talk about all kinds of stuff, except let's not talk about that which has been, is the very foundation of why we have a relationship with God. It's because we have been saved, we have been delivered from the wrath to come and been declared righteous to be in right relationship with God through the blood of Jesus. And you can say amen, hallelujah, glory be to God. Hallelujah. People don't want to talk about the blood. A lot of people don't even understand the blood. <coughs> I mean, the same bozo is telling you there's no devil. The same one's telling you the blood of Jesus is important, isn't important. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, look over there. I was talking about this along this line a little while ago. This is our legal position. Ever say my legal position? This is where you are. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. How many are born again? If you're born again, raise your hand. Guess what? You are in Christ. Do not refer to yourself as a believing sinner, as a sinner saved by grace. That's all I've ever heard in my church, preacher. Let me tell you something. It's not Bible terminology. When you got born again, you were translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. The Bible says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You can't be a joint heir with Jesus Christ if you're a sinner. Yeah, but I sinned last week. See, here's here's your mess up. The problem is, is you don't understand 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We are not sinners because we messed up last week and missed the mark. You're a sinner by nature. You're the righteousness of God by nature. When you get born again, you have a nature change. Oh, let's see, let's see you're, you can't be an Armenian. See, I, see, Pentecostals tend to be uh, on the Armenian side of theology. Man, if you sin and, and Jesus comes back before you get to repent, you go to hell. Why? Because you died. You've got to be born again again. You, get born, you can get born again once. You can come into the kingdom of God once. If you ever leave, you're toast. Now, I don't have time to go into it this week, but let me tell you, the, the threshold of leaving the kingdom is very, very high. You've got to know what you're doing. It ain't because you, you cussed last week. It ain't because you flipped me off when I drove by you on the interstate. <laughs> Greg said it wasn't him. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. One translation said a new species of being that never existed before. Hallelujah. Old things are passed away, and behold, all, I'm sorry, but, and behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation to wit, or, or King James, or, or Elizabethan for to know that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Verse 21. For he, now your King James Bible, how many are you using King James this morning? All right. They have it up on the, on the thing here. The words to be are italicized. Now how many know what that means? It means they're not in the Greek. They're not there. The translators added them because they thought it would help in bring clarity. That's just their opinion. The reason they italicize them is so you'll know they're not there. It's their opinion as to what should be there. But they, didn't, they weren't going to make it canon. They weren't going to make it scripture. They put it in there thinking it was going to be a help in reading. But we're going to leave them out. Why? Because they're not there. If you were reading this in Greek this morning, they wouldn't be there. The words to be in Greek would not be there. All right? I'm not changing the Bible. The translators, if you go ready to look in front of your Bible, words in italics, in italics are not in the original language. It was added by the translators for the purpose of hoping and, and hoping that would bring aid in reading clarity. It was their opinion, so it's not in the Greek. So we're going to read it like if we were reading from the Greek Testament this morning, translating it for you. All right? For he who knew no sin, I'm sorry, for, for he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became what we were, here substitution again. For he who knew, for, for he hath made him sin, not to be sin, he hath made him sin for us. What happened? God judged Jesus in our stead. He poured out his wrath on him. Judged because why? Because Jesus gathered up. Look, 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 look over in Colossians. I'm going to read it. I quoted it earlier, but I want you to see it in your Bible. Look over in Colossians. I know I'm running late, but is that okay? Y'all gave me 30 minutes. I've only used 15. Hallelujah. Look at verse 14 of chapter 2. Back at verse oh, 13, 12. 11, 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of, all, head of all principality and power, in whom also ye were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins and, and the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, everybody say, me. Point your finger at yourself. Say, me. All right. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcised in your flesh, Hath he quickened? Now, that's another old English word. Quicken means to make alive. And you hath he made alive. Thank God for, good, for understanding languages. Amen. Hallelujah. And you hath he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, as we said earlier, when Jesus came, when he was made sin, he came and uncovered all the atoned sins, he gathered up all the future sin. He gathered it all together, and he gathered up, and he went to his cross and took all the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And then God judged him for our sin. Now, your little crucifix you have in your house with a few drops of blood coming off Jesus' brow and a little bit coming off his hands and his feet is not even close to being accurate. The Bible says over in the book of he, Isaiah that he was, his visage was marred more than any man. Let me give it to you in plain English. He didn't even look human. He received the stripes of the Roman scourge. He had been beaten with rods. His beard had been plucked out. The thorns were an inch deep, an inch long, shoved into his head. He was nailed to the cross through the palms of his hands. And really, the palms really here. They, they, they consider this part of the palms, so it was nailed right here. And through his feet, all of that still did not cause him to be marred more than any man. What happened? All the sin and all the sickness and all the rebellion of humanity came on him on that cross. That's why the earth was dark. They couldn't look on him. They could not look at him. It, it would have been more than the human mind could have, could have handled to have seen him on the cross as he became sin, as he became sickness, as he became everything that was alienated toward God for us so God could judge him in our stead. 
He made him sin who knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. Jesus never rebelled against the Father. You know, the agony of Gethsemane was not going to the cross. The agony of Gethsemane was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from the Father. How? I don't know how that worked. God did it. It had to be done. <clears throat> so that he could become sin for us. So God could judge him and then raise him from the dead. It's a master plan. But at that time, he took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and nailed it to his cross. And people don't want to talk about the blood. There was a price paid for your redemption. There was a price paid so you could go around and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, a brand new creation in him. I'm a partaker of his divine nature. To me, he will not impute sin. There was a price paid. And it wasn't silver and gold. Hello? It was the precious blood of Christ. His life was emptied out. As he took all the handwriting of ordinances against you. The Bible says they were contrary to you. What do you mean? They were going to take you to hell. It was not a get out of hell free card. It was, I'm sending you to hell summons and sentence. And Jesus gathered it all up. Oh, hallelujah. Because the Father so loved the world, he turned to his son and said, will you go? Will you be made sin that they might be declared in right standing with me again? And the son said, I'll go. As he got closer and closer, he went to the garden of Gethsemane and said, is there any other way let this cup pass from me? But not my will, your will be done. There was no other way. It had to be done that way. If there was another way, God would have never sent Jesus. But there was no other way. Hallelujah. You ought to be thanking God you've been redeemed. You ought to be thanking God you're declared righteous. That you are now in right relationship with him and thank him for the blood of Jesus that was just shed. Hallelujah. Then we need just more blood songs around here. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. As we sit here with the, the weight of understanding the price that had to be paid to redeem us, to have us decreed and declared righteous, the precious blood of Jesus was shed that we might be delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of your dear Son. Thank you, Father. That through Jesus Christ, you took all the handwriting of ordinances against us and nailed it to the cross. And then Jesus shed his blood that we might have life. Hallelujah. And have it to the full. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You were willing to pay the price. That as the book of Hebrews says, you step back and, you, and for the joy that was set before you, Although you despise the cross and the shame of it, you went through it because on the other side, you would be able to present the, to the Father humanity declared righteous, justified, in right standing with you by the shedding of your blood. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.